discomfort is the thing that holds people back. And literally, neurological, it's hormones that are released. Acetylcholine as, is one of them, and, and dopamine, for example. These are the things that drive us to try and do something new. Adrenaline, so you've got those things together between, if you can get your, your body to release those three things together, you're gonna try something new and you'll feel an agitation because that's the adrenaline. But if you sit with it for 10 to 15 minutes, you get to a place where you're in more of a flow state. Focus much better if you can push through those first 10 to 15 minutes of something, whether it's study, whether it's um, going to learn something, playing an instrument. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Few Podcast uh, with me, Boo, and the perennial ageless uh, drinker of the founder of youth, Sean, Sean Still. Hey, Sean, how are you, mate? Great, Boo. Great, Boo. It's all, all good up here, mate. And um, it'd be good one day when we actually can do a uh, podcast in person. That would be awesome. But uh, in this day and age... Uh, we just need to uh, keep using the wonders of modern technology. I'm glad you got your camera working too. That was a uh, little bit of a hiccup at the start, but all good. You need to talk to your premier. I mean, we've got to, we have got to to figure out how COVID works. I mean, we can't keep having all of these walls and boundaries and uh, changing rules in terms of who can speak to what and say whatever. I mean, we. Man, I can't believe it. I mean, well, actually, we've done pretty well. We've done a few podcasts now. We haven't even mentioned the C word. Uh, but when, when's it going to happen? When are we going to see life life as normal, a life without isolation? Oh, who knows? At this point, who knows? You know, if, if we need to have uh, – people need to have more vaccinations or more or something different. But I'm sure the uh, the premiers will still make their decisions to uh, to close the borders, particularly uh, here in Queensland. Uh, a very itchy figure, trigger finger on right. that one. So, <laughs> But anyway – we digress. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Well, well, we kind of digress, but at the same time, we kind of created a nice segue there because we're our guest today knows a little bit about isolation and, and had to explore what isolation would look like in a one-way trip to Mars. And no doubt, uh, with that on your uh, resume or on the horizon, uh, you're probably going to come at life from a different perspective. Uh, she's also a bit of a guru in sustainability. And, uh, and a warrior against waste. Uh, so with no further ado, uh, let's welcome her to the few uh, podcasts today, Diane McGrath. Thanks so much for joining uh, Sean and I. Uh, thanks, Boo. Thanks, Sean. And I'm, uh, for those who are wondering which border I'm in at the moment, I'm in the ACT, so uh, a tiny little hole, a little bit um, <laughs> isolated as well, especially when we had our lockdowns. We couldn't even go... 10k because it would take us into New South Wales. Oh yes, it wouldn't. It would have. So, well, I, I was, was that similar to the, the training from Mars right? though? Like, it, is, it, is that isolating or <laughs> very similar? Well, I ended, I ended up having to well, quarantine. Let me camera, mate. I had to quarantine at one stage uh, during the during uh, ISO because uh, I had been inadvertently like days before lockdown just at a venue that someone else had been who was positive and and yep. So there I was locked in my bedroom for yeah for more than long enough. <laughs> So obviously, practice, yeah, practice. Boo started with the with the you know the kicker here, the um this concept about uh, you know a one way trip to Mars. I mean, I'm intrigued. Uh, I'm a bit of a nerd. I love watching what uh, what uh, Elon Musk's doing with SpaceX and seeing Richard Branson float float. And the movie his, Martian. You know, How good was that uh, movie? Movie, <laughs> movie Martian. That's it. <laughs> so um, you know, that, tell us a bit of the story. I mean, there's, there's obviously something to this. It sounds great. Yeah, it's well, uh, many people probably aware that I was um, one of the people that signed up to go one way to Mars. So Mars One, um, not-for-profit organization based in the Netherlands, set up like 10 years ago now. They started their, I guess, their foundation to try and get people to Mars. And their idea, the whole premise was one way because it was going to work one, one way much more realistically and sustainably and affordably than, uh, than a return journey. It's just a bit left of center of what you'd think about you'd normally do. Um, so, but just so talk about that for a second, Diane. I mean, <laughs> sure. what, what's that journey like, like contemplating the isolation and having to hang out with the same people forever? Don't people get married? <laughs> oh, no, they get divorced then too, don't they? <laughs> well, that's only um, one person. I mean, <laughs> you know, and we struggle with that. <laughs> and you could potentially no, replace no, actually, that person, but, you know. 
<laughs> it's true. It's so true. Once you're on Mars, you're stuck on Mars. There's no going back. Uh, but but I mean, that's the the whole premise of Mars One was was to send crews of four every two years from 2031 onwards, and um, and thus you know we were going to be all going one way in in very small crews uh, and with the same people until the next crew came two years later, then there'd be eight, and there'd be twelve. Etc. That's um, if the so original if, four were still didn't kill each other in that time, I suppose. <laughs> from, from, uh... Or if, <laughs> <laughs> well, the the whole concept as well with Mars One uh, was that they would go through the crews would go through ten years of training together first, yeah, so yeah. live wow. together, train together, everything. Yeah. So you'd be tighter than a family. Yeah, yeah. You'd be this whole new unit that's completely one hundred percent reliant on each other for survival. And it's a it's a shame that Mars One uh, ended up having to close their doors um, of recent times because it was something that's been an amazing part of my life as a, as a candidate for that and to to get through with their selection process to the final hundred worldwide out of was originally over two hundred thousand. Um, I'm still friends with them. Uh, we still keep in touch, yeah. all hundred of us. Uh, but and some of them. And did I you know, say out of two hundred thousand people? There's 200,000 people yeah. that want to go to another planet and never come back. That, 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 yes, that's, that's, that's quite correct. interesting. Can I pick them? Can we, can we pick them? <laughs> okay. Actually, it's a funny point you make there because there's an aspect of self-selection in this anyway, right? So who would, who would sign up to go one way to Mars? You know, just poll your mates when you go to the next barbecue or whatever or, or Friday drinks or now that we can all get into vaguely social context again. Would you go one way to Mars? You'll find a few people will raise their hands and others will go, you've got to be joking. <laughs> um, but, but so you've got a bit of self-selection there to start with, people who are of a particular mindset. Then as you're going through the selection process, what Mars One had us do was really start to hone down, not, just, not on our skills, but on our qualities. They were looking for people who were adaptable and resilient, curious, but had to be creative as well. Because, I mean, the whole concept, there's, there's no backup or support when you're on Mars, you've got to solve it all yourselves. You've got to help each other completely yourselves. So it, they really did a lot of work in tr- trimming us down to the 100. And I feel very comfortable if I, if I ever did have to go and live somewhere in a box <laughs> without being able to go outside like and breathe, uh, <laughs> with any of those folks. <laughs> Get out of my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> You'd have to do, there'd have to be a lot of work around ego in, in an environment like that. I mean, I couldn't imagine a, an environment where you'd need to be more selfless than doing something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And and while it, obviously looking after your health and mental well-being as an individual is critical, it's not just critical for you, it's critical for that team. But what was it what was it, it driving whatever you do for you is what, what was it was driving you to like seriously consider that and and I'm just really curious like what what, what is it that what's the thought process that goes into that? <laughs> there are a couple of ways I I like this this is one of the most common answer, questions sorry, I get answered, Sean. A lot of people want to know, why, why on earth would you do this? One answer is, you know, there's sustainability and I want to make a better place for society and all of this. And that's a really big part of it for me because if we, could, if we could show that we could live on another planet and have to be 100% reliant on solar, for example, um, we had to recycle everything, there was no resupply, um, Everything's 100% renewable. The works, food, secure, closed system, everything. Then we're going to have to learn all of those systems and develop that tech here on Earth first, prototype it, build up, etc. Before we send it to Mars, because you're not going to send stuff there that hasn't been proven. You're going to pilot test it here. So I thought, well, we have the opportunity to even turn this into Earth 2.0 just by trying to get to Mars. What a phenomenal mm. thing! What a legacy! And then there's my other answer, which I might say in a bit more of a relaxed environment, which is why not? <laughs> why not? Why not? Because what an amazing thing to do in life to to go and well, for me it would be retire, retire on another planet. Don't have to worry about you know, ever earning an income again. <laughs> uh, there's no mortgage to pay. But conceptually, <laughs> some people do that anyway. Um. <laughs> uh, exactly. Well, what can, off grid what in can a very we learn about way. that? Like I think. You know, uh, Sean's a big believer in showing up and, and commitment. And, you know, we live in a world where everything moves quickly and everything's disposable. And uh, like you would have to have a mindset shift there and some really deep thinking about sustainability, commitment. What, what can the rest of the world learn about the journey that you went on? 
Yeah, I mean, I actually, I've got a, an interesting story to tell you about the commitment and sustainability part. Of, a few years ago, I was, I was curious to understand whether I could live without bringing any new plastic into my life for a year. So I spent an entire year not purchasing anything with any plastic, not accepting anything with plastic on it, nothing, zero. And it was a, a really fascinating journey because it also, what it did, and this is um, part of the, the story here, um, Boo, was about it expanded the impact I had in other areas of sustainability in life. So by taking one journey towards one thing that's very focused, but really seeing what's possible with it, I ended up being able to do a heck of a lot more. I found myself recycling things I didn't realize it was, were recyclable. I ended up buying food that was more local, so supporting local economies. So it, it changed not just one field of behavior for me, but a broader one entirely. There must be hard though. Like what, what gets sold these days without single use plastic? I mean, yeah, well, actually, after, well, now that, you know, in our post COVID situation, there's a lot of single use stuff, isn't there? So I think we're, we did fall back into that for the last um, couple of years while we've been going through this because of plastic's got a value and a purpose in life. Don't, don't get me wrong. When plastic came out, it, it ensured that we could have um, safety and hygiene with our medical supplies and things of that sort of nature that are really important to us. We don't need plastic for as many of the things we do. No, it's and use don't, it I mean, for. it's not, not got got to that extent of saying you know, remove all plastic. But um, you know, no. this this year, um, for me, I made a I made a couple of changes in in my decisions to to move away predominantly or actually fully now for about seven months away from eating meat to actually move to more of a plant based mm. diet. We go to the um, the farmers market down the road every Sunday with the trolley, fill it up with stuff. And that's the one of the things I've noticed is that there's no plastic because you've got, mm. you know, you've got fresh food. I needed to buy a second fridge because of how much space it takes up, but, <laughs> but the, the, which is, it's like they got solar powered. But the, 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 the point is that th there's no plastic anymore. It's like, oh, we've got, you know, glass jars. We've got, you know, all the other stuff. We've avoided buying plastic on purpose. Um, and it's, and it actually wasn't that difficult. If you go to, a, if you go to mm. a farmer's market to buy, um, you know, some, some Brussels sprouts or something, um, they put them in a brown paper bag r rather than, or just put them straight into your, you know, your green shopping bag because you're going to wash mm. them before you use them anyway. You know, and it was like, you don't need these mm. plastic bags that come on a roll or th th there's a lot less of the, of the, that, that stuff that I've even noticed. As you said, it's made a difference not only in that, but in, in changing what I'm eating, it's actually changing the environmental impact I'm actually having now and I'm now teaching that to my kids and they're now starting to eat this, some more similar stuff, which means that by changing one thing, it's changed a number of others as a, as a like a, what is it? It was an un, unintended consequence in a positive way. Mm, absolutely. And it's sort of um, like the way that the, like the way that the earth spins on its axis, we get really cool stuff such as, you know, not just night and day, but when, when it works in conjunction with how the, the, the moon is, is moving through its orbit as well, we'll get, different shifts in tidal currents, really cool stuff just because the earth is turning. But it's not the function of why it turns, but these other really fascinating things happen just because it turns. Uh, and that's, I think this, this um, is, a, is a great example of that. I, I struggle. I think when you start getting above the stratosphere, like I used to love it and astronomy, <laughs> but then your head starts to explode. Like when you <laughs> genuinely try to comprehend it, uh, it's like, boom, a billion... <laughs> A billion of these things with the one sun we have and there's a billion of those out there i mean i Man, uh, i think uh, i take my hat off to quantum physics and, and and space explorers i think it's it's uh absolutely brilliant and for us you know getting to mars is a is a big mission but in the concept of the universe what it's like two grains of sand next to each other on a beach <laughs> that's crazy yeah, absolutely. And, and if it wasn't for the different interests and passions of all of us in our lives, we wouldn't have the extraordinary kaleidoscope of, of beauty in this world. So, and whether that's you know, art or, or the, in the business world or, or even just the, the, the ways that people enjoy their leisure too, it makes it worth, it makes it worth getting up. Absolutely. Get up in the morning. Uh, touching on sustainability again, I, I, mm. one of the things that came up when I was reading the, the, the background information and the things that you've, you know, that you've done and the things you stand for and stuff is, is a question that came for me is how bad is this problem of waste? you know, and with a, of, of wasting mm. food, of wasting, you know, perfectly good and maybe not so good, but, but 
of, of, of the way that we do things and how much waste is created from that. Yeah, well, food waste, you know, I could go on for hours about this, Sean. I won't. Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, <laughs> you probably... Three episodes for that, so. <laughs> Exactly. It's uh, part one. So part one, we're going to discuss the problem. Part two, we'll go through some of the solutions. Can we have a, we have a PowerPoint presentation as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, honestly, it is a big problem, but a lot of people don't realise they're wasting food. Um, and and they, they estimate that in Australia... In our households, we throw away roughly the equivalent of one shopping bag in five wow. worth of food. So I don't know how much any of your listeners buy each week in their groceries, but you can imagine just popping one of those bags just straight in the bin. It would be you think about how much money you spent on that, but but just that's just not just wasteful, but what a lost opportunity. You know, it's well, pretty like terrifying, isn't it? It is, especially when there's so many people who are hungry in Australia. Like it's a, um, during COVID as well, we had more people reach out for food relief from the food rescue organisations than ever before. And in fact, most of those that went through, like, I think it was nearly nearly 30% of people that went for food relief this year just gone for the first time they've ever had to go for it. Wow. So it's, we're, we've got a lot of food thrown away and at the same time people who need it. So we've got a bit of a disconnect here, but some of it's, there's a lot of reasons why it happens. You know, sometimes you, you go to the shops and they'll sell you something in a pack of 50 and you only want three. It, it, there's lots of... Pack it, the labelling of things, what date is that? I'm not sure. I better throw it out anyway. It could be fine, but I don't know. I don't risk it. Heaps of reasons, heaps of reasons. But there's also heaps of easy ways to reduce it. I mean, I'm sure, sure yourself, Sean, in the journey you've been taking in going to the local you know, farmer's markets, there's probably heaps of things you've been doing that have shown that some of those food lasts heaps yeah, longer. Absolutely. Especially when you buy it fresh and it's not been in a truck and then in a storeroom and then on another truck and then sitting out at you know in the supermarket on the shelf there for a while and it'll last two or three times as long it's just it's yeah which means you can you can use it but food, food's become food's become fuel though right like if you look at the world in terms of how we now approach productivity yeah you, you know we, we seem to have lost the uh the passion or the the art that comes with food and and diane you said that what impacted you was you were flying and you and you saw after meal service mm. Just everything, eaten or not, just goes straight into the rubbish. Yeah, and that was, I sort of jokingly call it snacks on a plane was my inspiration. Um, <laughs> so, you know, sitting on exactly that flight from Melbourne to Adelaide. No, it was okay, no, Sydney at the time. And, and the airline was, was exactly doing that. But they were handing out the trays with food. And I thought, oh, I don't feel terribly hungry this morning. I'll grab something and I might eat it later. Just, I know they say, don't take it off the plane with you. I was like, I'll just put that in my bag. Um, but but I was watching everyone else and I thought, oh, I bet you half of these people won't eat that. And then I wonder what what happens to that? Surely it's perfect. And it's usually always individually packed too, mm. right? You know, a little packet of this, a box of that. Um, and then the heavens opened up and there's the in-flight magazine that I read, on that same flight there's an article with Ronnie Kahn from Oz Harvest. And it's like, whoa, we should be donating this stuff. Why aren't we doing any stuff? I wonder what happens. And so this whole journey started for me, and that was nearly 10 years ago now. And ever since then, I've been doing stuff in this sort of space to see how can we prevent this going to waste? How can we improve? How it much- made such, such a big impact, Diane. You actually went out and, and knocked out a PhD on it, right? <laughs> I, I did. I'm now Dr. Di. Um, <laughs> I, it's not something I ever expected to be doing, working in waste. Waste doctor. Waste yeah. doctor. <laughs> Um, be nice if it was W A I S T. I'd be a health and fitness guru, but I'm not. I'm a food waste guru, um, and so that's this, this area though. Everybody loves food in some capacity, and, and while I recognise, you know, Boo, what you said about it being fuel to some people, it really is. Some people just do see food as fuel. Functionally, it has nutrition, it has carbohydrates, protein, fats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is it that we enjoy the most about food is when we socialise with other people, when we connect with the farmer's markets, the people that grew it, when we sit down around a table and enjoy a meal together or go out. What a novelty is that without a mask on uh, and, then, and eat a meal and laugh together. Food has so much more cultural value than just the fuel that it is at, at some times. And, uh, and if we connect with that cultural aspect of stuff, that can actually help us eat more of it too and waste less. I think we need to. I think more of our celebrity chefs need to to look at what we can do in that space. Like, how can we creatively teach people to use some of those unusual ingredients or the the leftovers that they don't well, know what to do? This with. is one of the things that I've learned in. Uh, I'm going to 
fairly, uh, or at this time of recording this, uh, seven months into a, a new relationship. And one of the things I've noticed from uh, my partner, um, she will open the fridge and I'll like open the fridge and go, oh, God, we're, we're going to have to go to the shops. She goes, what do you mean? And then she'll knock up some amazing thing. And I'm like, and she'll use like the stalks off the broccolini or another, because yeah, right. she's used the top bit for something else, keeps the stalks, mm. chops them up fine, then puts them into a risotto or something. And you can't, there's no, you can tell the difference. She goes, oh, no, no, don't throw that out. Keep that. And I'm like, for what? Because normally I just, if you use the chop, the top bit off, chuck the rest away. It was just like, it's this whole different way of looking at the ability. And it's, a, it's, a, it's something I said, I've, I have not been educated in this at all. I'd be in the negative, I reckon, if I was focusing on, um, on, on, you know, IQ when it comes to being able to be creative with food, I'd be in the negative because I'll literally open the fridge and be like, oh, there's nothing there. But she'd create a m- whole meal out of quotient. just the leftovers. I just, it just blew my mind because it's, it's an education thing. That's what it is, education gap. Can- food waste is just, I mean, food waste is just the one manifestation of human wasting stuff, right? Wasting time, yeah. wasting resources, our, uh, you know, just, just the litter, just the whole getting rid of plastic bags. Right. Well, mm-hmm. in, in your, do, do you touch on that, on that psychology at all? Diane, oh, and, what, and what you do, like, what is the psychology of, of waste and how do we reprogram ourselves? Yeah. And some of that's quite cultural to boo. I, there's a, there's an aspect of abundance too. We tend to find in Australia. So, uh, my PhD looked at food waste when we dine out in particular, and the, the information that came back through my PhD is, is, was quite a bit different to what we'd seen in, in global pictures, uh, in other international research. And, and the main reason was because Australians are a bit more affluent generally. We want to see more on our plate. We expect a little bit more. We want to see what we consider to be value uh, and don't mind leaving it then as well because it also shows I can afford to leave this. So there's, there's this whole aspect of affluence which has affected our waste. So we need to make... We need to make the, it doesn't have to be waste. We, we need to make what's left of our meal into something we consider just as valuable so that we don't let it go. We, we want to hang on to it. We want to bring it home or, oh, I'm just going to shove that last mouthful in because my great-grandma made this and it's always amazing. You know, add value to it. Keep the value of it and don't just let it finish with those last few bites. It's, you're right. I and mean, I think that's one of the things that, that I've noticed. Um, you know, when I was in my, my teens, we would occasionally go out or a meal or something like that. It was a very rare experience. Like going to a restaurant, that uh, was a very rare experience. I think my kids at least once a week, probably twice a week, eat out at a restaurant because I love eating at restaurants. The one thing I've noticed is that this, the, the size of everything over time is, has actually become bigger. There is this, I think, this, yes. said, this expectation mm. around affluence and stuff. But likewise to that, some of my favourite restaurants, which aren't necessarily you know, the, the, the most uh, budget-conscious uh, ones, they've kind of pulled it back and it's, it's a higher quality now. And I actually enjoy that a lot more than realize you're so sophisticated, mate. Oh, mate I, thought, I just thought you were like, uh, it's been hanging around like you, but it's, like it's, it's, helped, it's helped to polish the edges, you know, like of the rough diamond. You know? <laughs> well, they can, you can polish a turd as they say, but anyway, you know, it is what it is. But, <laughs> but that's influence, shows, mate, not influence. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that just show though, how, how value can be perceived so differently yeah. You know, just and this is the same in any business, right? Isn't it? I mean, you don't have to be right down the bottom of the market and you know put the cheapest price out and just keep on adding. And I'll give you this free stuff. Give a good quality product on a plate, big plate, small item. Add something else around it, and you've got a much more attractive value proposition mm. for that customer. I think you said it Whether yourself. Whether that's food or something right, else. It's, it's the it's the experience that wraps around it. If you've just got a giant yeah. meal and the experience is average, you're probably not going to remember any of it. But if you've got a, a maybe a smaller meal that's really really nice and you know all that sort of stuff, good quality ingredients and everything, but the experience of having that meal, that's what you're going to remember. You're going to go back to that restaurant again, and I think that's what, mm. when I, and that's what I've, I guess I've usually uh, focused is is my one of the things I loved and I missed the most when COVID first happened is I couldn't go out to a restaurant. And I love going out to yeah. a restaurant because it's that social aspect, it's that connecting with other people, it's it's you know enjoying food together and conversation, and it's you know having. Um, and particularly when you're in you know, a local smaller area like I am here in Noosa, you get you get to know mm. the owners of the of the restaurant, and they come and say good day, and they give you know they have jokes with the kids or whatever, and you know it's it's a whole experience of it. And and as you said, it's not just the food; it's not just about that, and it it doesn't need to be gigantic and big and have all this potential potential waste. But you can definitely see that sort of 
uh, affluence, how, how that affluence, um, you know, higher level of affluence would would uh, mean that people are more easily more wasteful. Because I remember you know, my parents, uh, they they had a, a very uh, challenging, I suppose, for want of a better term, uh, a time um, in financially for for many years there from a, from a couple of, from a couple of bad business decisions, and it was you know we had to count the dollars, they had to count the dollars, they had to be very so nothing went to waste. You know, it was a very different mm. way of looking at things. Yeah, absolutely. I was uh, as a child myself. I grew up in the Northern Territory in the outback, um, which not a lot of people know this. I I grew up from the age of ten to seventeen in remote Aboriginal communities. Um, so I lived in the Simpson Desert uh, first for a few years, and well, I think it was ten to thirteen then, and then fourteen we lived in the sort of the, the fringe camp in Alice Springs, uh, and then we lived up in the Tanami Desert for another three years. Um, right, so no, no, no wonder you there. want to go to Mars. <laughs> I know what this red dirt's like. (laughs) Isolation, some isolation. Um, What's that like? Like, what? That's a very unique upbringing, and and how much of that has shaped your attitudes towards culture and societies? I guess the anthropology of of things. Mm, Oh yeah. Look, gosh, everything you do as a child shapes your perspectives, doesn't it? Even if you don't realise it for many, many years, and. I think drawing on just that word you've just used then, Boo, things. One of the biggest lessons I learnt when I was a child in that in that region was about no one owns a thing. We share a thing. If someone's lucky enough to bring something, whether it's income or a new record player or whatever it is, because this was back in the 80s, so we didn't have exciting things like DVDs or whatever in those days, um, but if someone brought something like that into the community, it was everyone's. Everyone had the chance to use it. It sometimes would disappear from your home because someone had come to just use it for a while. Um, as a little child, I, well, at the age of 10 or 11, I thought, someone's stolen my blah. But after a while, I came to realise, oh, it's not my blah. I've brought something into this community. This has enriched the community. They all get the chance to share it. So that was a phenomenal learning as a child and has definitely influenced a lot of the things I've done in life, for sure. Well, that, that Mars thinking, I would presume, is exactly the same, right? Like it's this, the community stuff that you all need to yeah. utilise in a way that delivers outcomes that sustain life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's a, it's like the – I know we've been talking about this um, before offline as well uh, the other day that – in marketing, because I used to work in marketing for many years, there's this concept of growing the pie. You know, when it's a competitive environment, everyone's fighting for their own slice of the pie. But if you're in an isolated environment or a small community where the, the market's only, like, it's this big, those other players aren't going to be around if you try and fight and get all the pie. That means you're also not going to have customers too because it's a tiny community. So the best option for all and for you is to grow the pie. So what can we bring into a community? What can we bring into a competitive environment that actually grows it and makes it sustainable for everybody? I stole that, by the way. Uh, when I was in America, I used that st- I used that to try and explain to people how you partner in another country. Yeah. Like, hey, oh, right, yeah. right. you're not growing your slice of the pie here. We're growing the pie. And look what happens to your slice. It happens to grow as well. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate that. That was a... A nice little uh, uh, metaphor to influence uh, an outcome there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that, and that's, uh, look, we haven't even touched on that, Diane. You were like, you're like a pretty full-on, serious, high-flying marketing exec too, right? I, uh, yes, I have been. I, um, my final formal marketing role that I had was with GSK, so GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, I was in uh, charge of a billion-dollar portfolio of um, childhood immunisation vaccines for the world, um, and I was based in in Europe and I manage this huge portfolio and uh, I bet every single one of the children you know and probably you have been jabbed by it. <laughs> so, but it's, it was a fascinating, that particular role, I, I mean, I was in marketing for many years prior with a number of other brands as well, um, but looking after the portfolio that worked across just about every single country in the world was a really extraordinary experience because you, you had to develop a way of storytelling and connection with the brand that could be universal but not be so single-minded. You had to allow for flexibility that recognised and allowed local input and cultural recognition. um, But you had to somehow find a way that you had a 
as they say in, in France, that the field rouge, like the red line that, that runs through everything that everything else could connect to. That's true. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a real chat. That's a big challenge for multinationals and some do it really well and some do it terribly. Um, Absolutely. You, you look at so Nike are a great example of a brand that is consistent with, they've got their, their swoosh and that could be, it's as long as it looks the same and as long as contextually it's still demonstrating the same sort of outcome for that user, that user experience, to, to take your, your words there before, Sean, to, to really reflect that experience, why can't that be done in different cultural viewpoints? It's actually, it's a good point. Like what do you, what do you, uh, nothing to do with uh, sustainability or food waste, but <laughs> what are the biggest mistakes people make and, and business owners when it comes to their brand? Oh, golly. Uh, Another three episodes. Sometimes, that, is there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Let's just make it the, the, the top three things. <laughs> <laughs> top three things. Top three mistakes in in branding. Um, inconsistency is probably one of them. People often want to change their brand. Frequently. Are you talking about a message, the, look, feel? Like what? What are you referring to? All of the above. Um, message. If you're putting out a different message every year because you're a new marketing person, because often they'll there'll be a cycling of brand managers sometimes through a larger organization or in the one organization, even if it's the, the same brand manager year on year, as a brand manager or a brand owner, sometimes you get a bit bored with saying the same thing all the time. But your customers need to hear that same thing all the time because that's what's giving them assurance that you're still the same thing that I love. There's nothing different about you. I can trust you because you're consistent. So the consistency of messaging of color of your brand, as soon as you change the color of your brand, people don't notice you as much as well. And you've got to, you've got to be there when you don't think you need to be there. Like you think of, we've just come out of, or coming out of lockdown, and it reminds me of when, um, say, the big you know, Pepsi and Coke wars. In the, was it, the Second World War, I think it was, that Coke decided to stop advertising during the latter parts of the war. They thought, oh, this is really no point. You know, people haven't got money and et cetera. Um, Pepsi kept advertising. Who do you think had a huge market share when the world opened up again and had money? Wasn't Coke. So well, Coke yeah. didn't have to worry, right? It, it just put cocaine in, in the drink and uh, marketing <laughs> looked after itself. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but the, the point is that if if you're not on, it's it's called the evoked set. To get on someone's evoked set, it's like when you start thinking of of um, oh, I want a I want a soft drink, and so your mind goes to all the different sorts of soft drinks. Coke, Pepsi, whatever else, to get on that list, that list is called the evoked set. But if you're not being reminded that the you exist, you're going to drop off the set. It's like, it's like you, know, you, know, you know when you do a Google search and these days the top part of your screen is all ads now. It's like ugh, you scroll down to something that's actually useful and that's usually only about three items. To get in there is really, really hard now. And it's the same thing with your, your mental evoked set. We're constantly getting bombarded with messages to keep in someone's mindset. You've got to keep putting it, put it out there. So I think, I think marketing to, is really to important. add to that too, like you, you, you know, we're talking about the story of the, the, of the war and Coke saying, well, there's no point marketing at the moment. That's the, the, what I've seen a lot of business owners fall into that trap in difficult times, be it, you know, mm-hmm. post um, GFC, uh, you know, COVID and stuff. It's like, oh, there's all this stuff going on. I'm going to lean back. I'm going to step back from marketing mm. and from promoting. And I think it's the worst thing you can do. The people that I've seen that have actually doubled down have taken market yep. share off those people that have backed out, like you said, Pepsi did, is because you're staying front of mind. When the person has the money again, you're now at the top of that evoke list, bang, that they mm. will buy your product and not the other one. And I think that's the thing that, that yep. particularly small business owners are, are making mistakes and even the bigger ones is, you, you, if anything, double down while everyone else's baits out mm. of the water when they've gone home and packed up their fishing gear, well, put more lines in, you know, because you're, you're much more yeah. likely to catch, um, catch the fish then. Yeah, and I took that sort of personal philosophy um, to my life during COVID lockdown last year. I was in Melbourne, and at the time I lived in a tiny studio apartment. I'd never, I had no balcony, nothing. I really was living in a box for that, our extraordinary lockdown last year in Melbourne. Horrendous. Anyway, but... Like you did your Mars nice. training, so that was still good. <laughs> I've done quite a bit of isolation training. It's, it's, so <laughs> some aspects are like, oh, I've been there, done that. Um, but but with this one, I 
I thought, well, and Mars One was pretty quiet at the time. They were like, oh, well, we, it's COVID. No one's investing on anything at the moment. So we're really finding it hard to bring all of you guys together because the next stage of selection was they were supposed to bring all 100 of us together to go through this final stage of selection to trim us down to those who would be trained to go. Uh, and I thought, well, Mars One's on pause. All these other companies are on pause. I don't have to go on pause just because they are. In fact, I didn't. I did exactly that. I doubled down. I kept, kept my, um, my rod in the water. It's like, well, what can I learn from this experience? How can I make sure that, that when this is over, I'm more Mars ready than I was at the start? Uh, and so, you know, I started learning even more about what my body could be facing if I go to Mars. What could I change? What could I alter? Uh, and biohack, um, one of my hobbies is I'm a biohacker. Um, what could I biohack with little access to the, the usual tech that I would? Uh, so yeah, it was, I really doubled down during that time. Mm. No pause. Tell us about the biohack now, because we're actually not talking to Diane version one right now, right? <laughs> we are. We actually are now in a conversation with <laughs> Diane two point oh. Two point oh. That's uh, correct. <laughs> and so so how does how do we how do we upgrade ourselves? What did you do? How, how did you define that transition? Yeah. Well, I applied a very scientific sort of method to it, um, and I'm not going to be flippant about it. I actually did. I, I call I call it the scientific method because it really does apply the way you approach anything in science. You know, you get curious about it, you you examine it, you you plan it out, you prototype stuff, and you you monitor it and you tweak it, etc. It's it's part of design principles as well, and uh, and so I. I'd spent all this time, like when I first got shortlisted for Mars, I, I realized how incredibly risky it was. The, the chance of losing my hearing, vision, um, becoming, um, oh, well, a brittle, so brittle bone to be worse than osteopenia, uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal impacts on my body. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound very attractive, but I really want to go to Mars. So how do I make sure those things don't happen? So I started working on changing my physiology. I started trying to work out, well, if that's what could happen. What else might happen if I took a different approach? Um, and I, I first looked at the things that might impact on that. Like say bone mass is a really good example. So usually, usually, normally people lose about, or women in particular, lose between 1% to 3% of their bone mass year on year as we hit you know, 40s, 50s and so forth. And I'm 52. Um, and at that time, I was in my mid-40s and, and, and I was told, oh, well, you know, that's, you're going to go through menopause, you'll lose you know, up to maybe 20% of your bone mass. That's just life. You're a woman. Too bad. Uh, <laughs> and that is also what happens to astronauts. They lose 20% of their bone mass in six months mm, in space. Yeah. Something it takes women, you know, five years to lose, they lose in six months. Phenomenal. And I thought, hang on a sec, I'm both of those things potentially. <laughs> woman, astronaut, that's really not a good picture. So I learned a lot about what breaks bone down and why that might be happening. And and I started to to work with, brought in specialists. And I know you guys are big on this too. Like even though you might be, you know, phenomenally successful in whatever you do, you always bring in always. experts to make sure you can yeah. you can be the best and really can optimize stuff. So I brought in an um, endocrinologist. I, I worked with um, guys from overseas. I, um, I looked to you know, research you know, the scientific evidence and that as well and started playing around with new tech. Uh, and I've managed to, instead of having my bone mass decrease year on year, uh, for the last probably four years, it's been increasing about 2% every year, <laughs> which is phenomenal and I'm now I have a my back in particular is um you couldn't break it with a stovey pole it's it, it's stronger than a 20 year old and that's a um, telephone pole for yeah, anyone oh, that's yeah. not from south australia sorry yeah, yeah. thank you i didn't know what the I, translation you, was but thank you Vic. sorry i used to live in south australia for a number of years so stovey pole is a, a telephone pole so yes you could i've got a very very strong back <laughs> it's not very no, I, I, and that's i remember you and i having a chat about this diane because i had yeah. the same thing with an autoimmune disease that that makes you osteoporotic. Yeah, uh, right. yeah, they yeah. say the same thing. You've got to take this this medication, and and then you read about it, and you're like, well, if you if you bear weights and use your bones and put some put put some uh, pressure on them exactly. and make them work, mm. and I, and it was literally 18 months doubled my bone density, and oh, yeah. and and the endocrinologist that I was seeing was like, what? How did you? Have you been taking the medication? I said, no, I didn't take any of it. I've just been lifting heavy weights at the gym. 
Uh, you would, yeah. That was a long time ago. Obviously, it don't look like that now. But uh, <laughs> certainly at the time, it, uh, it, it, it made a big difference. Absolutely. But if, if you hadn't have researched it and, and worked out for yourself, well, why does it have to be you know, what's going on here and just trusted one person's perspective, you would have been on a pill potentially that may have worked a bit but also may not have. And not that I've got anything against medication. Medication is invaluable when it's needed. Absolutely. I, don't, I do not question that at all. Modern med- I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a long time. Absolutely critical. Uh, and, and so thus, but fit for purpose. Yeah. One of the, one what of the things do, what do we need? that piqued my interest uh, – is a couple of years ago, uh, about a year ago, I think it was maybe now, I went to an optometrist because I haven't hold things a little bit further back now that I'm you know, 46 <laughs> and stuff. Uh, and, um, and they said, oh, that's just what happens. Your eyes wear out, you know, and, and this is just what happens. So now you need glasses. And I'm like, <laughs> but not every day I need glasses. And I find when I wear the glasses, mm. I need to wear the glasses more. So I've avoided wearing them for a year, probably Correct. worn them 10 times when I'm really ultra tired or something just to mm. get through a period of time. But you mentioned there something about biohacking, you know, your eyesight. Yeah, stuff like be Any tips for those of us that are in this uh, stage of life where we're starting to have to hold, get a, like a <laughs> selfie stick to be able to read a book? <laughs> well, some people might take the, the, the short way and uh, take the, a photograph with their phone and make it larger. When that's useful. Yeah, it's good but for it's, a menu. It's, it's, a, it's, it's good <laughs> for a menu, but that's probably about it. Um, this is something which can be reversed over time and, and I think people forget that our eyes are also that the focal length that changes for our vision to be clear is is muscular. So it's a bit like what Boo was doing to increase his bone mass. He realized it's like, oh, I've got to lift heavy stuff. I've got to do some things that create force, that create tension, that that push things to change. If we don't give our muscles or our bones or whatever a reason to change, to adapt, they don't have to. So so exactly what you were doing there, Sean, by, by not wearing your glasses all the time, it, it actually will force your eyes to try and work a bit harder. Mm. Uh, and there are little techniques you can do. Um, definitely vision, visionary stuff in distance. We're often in rooms and we or in you know, look away from your computer, look <laughs> away from your computer every 90 minutes or whatever, but not just look across the room. The room is still only a couple of metres away, the side of the room. Look out a window. Look at something which you know is probably about a kilometre away. Try and trace the outside of a tree that is that far away. You, might, you won't be able to do it straight away, but over time, if you do that regularly, you'll find you'll be able to see things. Your, your, your muscles will have a greater range of motion. Um, There's some imperial data around that through pilot selection. Like They know that if they recruit rural uh, kids that come through, their eyesight's always markedly better than city kids because their whole life is out and looking on the horizon and trying to find things. And um, so, yeah, that's a, the biohack is a, we need to, we need to like schedule about another rack of about five podcasts, mate. And I think we'll be able to. <laughs> Let's buy, okay. Unpack. Episode one, biohacking your eyesight. Episode two, biohacking a bad attitude. <laughs> Episode three, biohacking your ego or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, I think we've got, we, we uh, have the, have the capability to learn, learn so much here. Oh, so Diane, what, what would you sort of, yeah, like you've, you've obviously uh, uh, facilitated a lot of change and transition in your life. Yeah. yeah. And, and for a lot of people that feel like they're in a rut or, mm. you know, can't, can't quite get there. What, what are some of your, your hacks there in terms of what holds people back and, and, and what's on the other side when you break through that wall? Discomfort is the thing that holds people back. It's, and this is completely neurological, literally neurological. It's particular hormones that are released. Acetylcholine is, is one of them and, and dopamine, for example. These are the things that drive us to try and do something new and the acetylcholine. And, and, and as well as that, there's the um, adrenaline. So you've got those things together between if you can get your, your body to release those three things together, you're going to try something new and you'll feel an agitation because that's the adrenaline. But if you sit with it for 10 to 15 minutes, you get to a place where you're in a, you're in more of a flow state. So, and that's anything, absolutely anything. The body does that for adaptation. Absolutely. You will focus much better if you can push through those first 10 
to 15 minutes of something, whether it's study, whether it's um, going to learn something, playing an instrument. Your first warm-up exercise, like I, um, one of the things I learned to do during COVID lockdowns has been to to draw. And uh, um, and it's one of the things we, you build into that is the warm-up period. This is the time where you can draw your most crap picture that you'll draw ever in your life. Because it's okay, because you're going through the discomfort. It's like, oh, that doesn't look like an arm. It's, it's certainly not an eye. It, just go through that stuff because, like, it's okay. You'll get through that bit. You'll get through that bit and then... There it is. Yeah, actually, so, I've not heard it persist. communicated that way. What you're saying, it's like I've heard lots of things about people saying overcome. You got to go through discomfort. You got to push through. But understanding it on that on the level of of what our neurology, yeah, what, of, yeah. of physiology, of what what our bodies are releasing to mm-hmm. um, support learning of something new. And no one ever said learning mm-hmm. something new is comfortable. But if you know that if you stick it out for 15, 10, 15, maybe twenty minutes, then on the other side of that is where that growth is really going to start to happen once you've moved past that. That makes it really tangible. That, and I've, and I've, I've heard something before. Someone actually said, I just jump, remind it now, they said, set a timer for 30 minutes and always do it for at least 30 minutes. And I think they're referring to the same thing. That by that time, you're past the discomfort, the, the biggest, the peak of discomfort, and now getting into yep. a state, more state of flow where you're, you're more receptive to learn. So that's a great, you know, a great little hack again, which is awesome. And it fits in nicely, that 30-minute thing you're talking about there, Sean, fits with the, the, the body's natural daily rhythms. We've, we've heard of these things probably called circadian rhythms. People have heard of that. That's like the 24-hour cycle our body goes through for sleep and wake and all of that. But there's another rhythm that we have each day that happens every 90 minutes of the day. It's called ultradian rhythm, rhythms. And these, these are like almost like mini versions, peak trough, peak trough, peak trough, every 90 minutes. And so you'll find if you're sitting working, after about an hour and a half, you're really like struggling, really struggling. If you're like, no, I'll just keep flogging through, through this. I'll keep working on this this report or whatever it is. Got to get up and move out of it. Then come back and you'll come back in after about 15 minutes of doing something totally different. Come back in and you'll come in when it's still going to be that struggle time. Once again, push through that. And that's the body getting into that, oh, it's struggle, struggle, and I'm in zone again. So you work with the I natural. Think a little bit of- a little bit of circadian rhythm uh, theory as well as it's a it's actually a twenty five hour rhythm that we cram into twenty four. Yeah, which is so why true. we, which is, which is why we feel tired all the time because we're trying to fit twenty five hours of what we want into twenty four, and why we always uh, we always when we're pushing the clock forward on travel, it's easier to acclimatize than when we push it back. Um, it makes me think though, Boo, about we, how we're always trying to squish that extra hour into stuff. Why yeah. don't we try and take less like i try and do less in the time i've definitely definitely found that definitely found that works um you know going from doing 80 to 100 hours a week for over seven years being nearly 20 kilos heavier in weight having clinical depression like all that stuff all at once which was not a great period of my life as i say i won't change it because it's made me who i am today and it's given me a lot of learnings and tools but but the one of the things yeah, but i'll tell you what mate geez, you're, you're so much harder to get hold of these days honestly <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but giving yourself more space to what I found yeah. is that the harder you push, the less effic- effective you are. And if you yeah. can pull back, you're going to be more effective in those periods of time. And I think one of the things that, and I've seen this a lot in, in, in my inner circle group, working directly with business owners, it's such a common thing. It's like, oh, I'm you know, putting this thing off. I'm procrastinating on this. I'm not doing that. And it's that perception that this thing is going to be hard. And I think it's not actually what you're saying is what little sort of association has come up here. It's not just the thing that they're doing is going to be hard. I think we're preempting the feeling that's going to happen when we try and do this thing that's new and we want to run away yeah, from it. Right. And so if absolutely we realize right. there's that 15 to 20 minutes that, and then when you get to, and I did, I was doing it the other day, there was a thing I was putting, I had some, you know, emotionally personal kind of stuff and I'd put it off for about three months. Oh, I'll do that Monday. Oh, maybe Thursday next week. <laughs> oh, maybe the next week. And I kept putting it off. And uh, my partner's just like, no, nah, you're going to do it. And then, and, and, and don't come out of your office till you're finished. I was like, oh, <laughs> took me 45 minutes. And I came out and went, how was that even remotely difficult? It was the feeling that I had about the difficulty of going through it. Did it in 45 minutes, walked out and went, I just feel like a knucklehead now because I could have done it three months ago um, without causing myself all this anxiety or stress uh, that of, and guilt of not doing it and of pushing it back because I don't generally do that with, with anything. I'll be like, right, that needs to be done this week. Get it done. Bang. It's done. It's out. This is one of those things that was just, it had some emotional attachment to it and it was 
like had some deep stuff going on and I knew how I'd feel starting it. And I did, I felt it for that first 15 or 20 minutes. But after that, it was just like, and it, the rest of it went in no time. And it was, so it's great to see those, like here, every time I'm on the, on the, the podcast with our guests, are always learning something new and new associations. And I think that's the thing. It's, it's despite the discomfort, if you know it needs to be done, you need to do it anyway. Yeah, and that's usually what drives me to, to do something new. If I feel a bit uncomfortable about it, it's like, okay. So was that like running ultra marathons, extreme distance cycling, <laughs> sailing in gale storms yes. with tall ships and all these other fun stuff that it sounds like you've done in your spare time whilst yeah, training absolutely. to go to Mars? <laughs> absolutely. As Jocko so eloquently puts it, embrace the yeah. suck, right? <laughs> yes, embrace the suck. Well, if you, I don't know. I don't want to be there, you know, whatever your philosophy is. I don't want to be the pearly gates or the, the last days and go, Oh, well, you know, I got up and went to bed every day, whatever. I want to like sit there and go, wow, that was a fascinating time, wasn't it? I'm so pleased I was here for that. Yeah. You know, so so what that means though, I know if I, if I want that sort of end day experience, I've got to push through the stuff that I know is going to be rubbish sometimes. Absolutely. Because it's going to be, I know, like you, like you said there, Sean, you know that after you push through the bit that you know is uncomfortable and painful, that's where the, it, everything opens up. It's also the reward. Always. The reward comes yes. at that time. You feel the reward. Yeah. I'm sure there's dopamine hits mm. and all the rest of it and mm -hmm. you feel like yep. you've achieved something. And I think that's what you're saying too is that thing about if you get to the end of your life and you're looking back, you're not going to regret the things you did. You're going to regret <sighs> the things you didn't do that you weren't yeah. game enough yeah. to do or that you, you know, you, there was too much discomfort to actually move through and do them. And, and I think that's that's a big, I love that philosophy. It's a big part of, uh, you know, my philosophy on life as well is is not to live with regrets for one, but also mm. look at those things that. And I myself haven't done an ultra marathon, but I ran Sydney Marathon uh, once, only once. Mm. Uh, long story, but um, yeah, five hours and seventeen minutes later, and feet that were twice awesome. the size as usual, I still finished it. I uh, couldn't walk for two <laughs> weeks afterwards, but I still managed to finish it. I'm never going to do it again. But I put myself into that discomfort. I did the training for it. Um, and uh, didn't realize that, you know, flying back 40 hours beforehand gave me DVT and caused all sorts of medical problems <laughs> oh, I didn't realize no. I had. But, you know, the, the point is that there were things there that I never, ever thought I'd do. Some, my, mate, my mate's like, mate, we've done the, the half marathon. Let's do the marathon. I'm like, sure, why not? When is it? It's in eight weeks. I'm like, okay, I've only ever run a half marathon before, but surely it can't be that bad. And, you know, just said <laughs> yes and then tried to figure it out, figure it out afterwards. <laughs> well, and that, I think that's the approach Say yes and then work out, is this feasible or is it not feasible? How do I do it? doesn't mean you can't then change your mind too. We have the capacity when we have more information to go, you know, this maybe is not the right mm. time for mm. this. And, and don't say no to yourself straight up. Allow yourself to take that step and do the work and then know that's, that's a no for now. And for now. That's the thing. It doesn't always have to be forever. It, it pushing that, pushing those boundaries. And I think when you get to a certain point in life, you just realize I've, I've lived a good life now. Like I, mm. I don't, I don't have anything I really regret doing and I don't have anything I feel like I don't want to do. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a nice place to end up. And I think when you, when you live that life where you define success on your own terms, you, you just, you're able to give back in a way that's really positive, I think. Yeah, and it makes it like I love the name and the philosophy of your podcast as well, The Few, and, you know, what does it mean? And I've thought about it quite a bit. What does it mean to be someone who's part of the few or to strive to be in the few? And for me, uh, and this is probably something you might ask later, but I'm sorry, I'm going to jump the gun because it fits in so nicely here. Boo, it's, it's, it's around how by being by, – by, by bringing – realizing that we may be few but through that we could become many and that's and so by focusing on what we do so well bring our best to whatever we do all the stuff that Sean talked about before as well earlier about then all of the effects that it has on other people you know, what can we do so that the many grow by what we do individually I'm a big believer in that that's, that you know you can change the the world one person at a time because yeah. I think that's the only way to do it deeply, properly, permanently is to have an impact on somebody else. And that person has the snowball effect of impacting other people. And it's, it's, it's huge. And clearly 
you know, clearly you've learnt a heck of a lot in so many amazing uh, adventures and, and uh, things that you've done in your life so far. If you were to take the less, some of the lessons, you know, what, what are the key lessons mm. from that? Go back to, you know, maybe that 13, 14, 15 year old version of yourself living out in the community <laughs> in, in NT and mm. te- give yourself, you know, a lesson or a couple of those lessons that you've learned. What would you go back and, and, and say to yourself? Probably two things. And the first is it's going to be okay because as a, as a girl, as a teenage girl, and I'm sure you know, teenage boys went through the same sort of stuff for their own way, being part of a community or a group or whatever means a lot. People don't want to feel so isolated and I did live in a lot of isolation um, and so as a, as a young girl, I, I, I didn't know if I'd ever have friends or if I'd ever you know, be able to um, do anything that was of value in the world. And I, and so to just trust, I would say, Diane, it's okay, just trust the journey. It's going to be okay. You will have incredible friends. You will get to do the most amazing things you never could dream about. Um, you might even get to go to Mars, who knows. <laughs> But just trust the journey and do the things that you dream about because they don't have to sit on a shelf. You can make them happen. They are all realizable. Um, and one of the things, and so I'd then tell that little Diane, that probably 20-year-old Diane, was given a, you, you'll be given a book by your grandfather uh, and it's um, called The Richest Man in Babylon. Uh, and it was by a guy named George um, Carlson or Clausen or something. Uh, anyway, but I remember my grandpa gave me this book when I was around 1920, and, and it was around you know how to invest money and and, and that very simply in a fable. And but the the philosophy is you give 10 percent to yourself of anything you earn. So put that aside for yourself first before you pay any of your debtors before you pay anything else. Um, which is good philosophy in business. Sure, make sure you invest in yourself first. But what I would like to tell. 13-year-old Diane, 14-year-old Diane, 15-year-old Diane, invest in yourself first. Work out what 10% you need to give to yourself every day of whatever it is, of time to yourself, of energy to yourself, of love to yourself, of connection with others. What is it that you need to grow? Give yourself 10% of that before you give to others. So that's that's I love fun. that. Yeah. Really profound. Yeah. Do it like that's the best time. advice you can give to someone that's young because you, ten percent of your whole earning life is a, an inordinate amount of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome, yeah. uh, Diane two point That was uh, <laughs> a really super insightful, super insightful conversation, and you've obviously got like a really such a great depth of humanity uh it exudes in out of you in 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 the conversations, and I, I think the world. And the few are very blessed to have have you on the team. So thanks so much for sharing your time with Sean and I today. And that wraps up another episode of The Few. Thank you to our partners, Afterburner, for team building, development and alignment. We understand now how important it is to have the right people around you. Get them on board with where you want to go. Momentum Media, the largest industry publisher in the country, connecting your business to the Australian community. ICMI, Australia's premier speaker bureau, representing the few that do fulfill their life's purpose. And finally, Sean's Inner Circle, the business coaching organization for small and medium enterprises looking to make that next step. Thanks again for listening in and downloading today. Please leave a review on whatever platform you are currently listening to this podcast and reach out to our partners who can help you make the transition to the few. Thanks, Boo. Thanks, Sean. It's great to be part of the many. Indeed. (laughs) Thanks so much.